Welcome to the Bioinformatics CRO podcast. I'm Grant Belgard, and joining me today is Tony Altar. Tony, can you introduce yourself? Well, hi, Grant. Yeah, it's great to be here on the podcast. My name is Tony Altar. I have a PhD degree in neuroscience. I've spent the major part of my career working on neuropharmacology, neuroscience, and helping develop and create drugs for people with psychiatric conditions. Um, been more recently involved in the neurological side of brain disorders. And as a result, I've moved my career more from the pharmacological approach to gene therapy and genetic approaches, because I think neurological disorders are more uh, a cause of genetic problems and problems at the early expression of genes, uh, as opposed to drug mechanisms for psychiatric disorders. So I've really moved my career quite a bit in just the last 10 years. Great. And let, let's talk about your career. Maybe start start from the beginning, because I think it's a, a pretty interesting path. But um, maybe if we can go way back uh, to, to child, Tony, um, you, you know, what, what kinds of things were you into? Uh, how did you end up in science? Uh, what, what other uh, possibilities did you entertain? No, I love that question, Grant, because I think for all of us, uh, understanding the origins of our own careers, our own interests, are really informative and important because I think those are some of the enduring parts of our personality that help us through the tough times as well as the good times in our career. So for me, that that's true as well. Um, my interest in science started with my own father, who was a fairly successful theoretical physicist and uh, extended to, I guess I would call him my second father, a man named Art Uweiler, who ran a neurobiochemistry laboratory which at the age of 17, when I started working there, I don't think I could even pronounce neurobiochemistry, nor did I really understand much of what these guys in the lab were saying. But it was a fascinating experience. And uh, between my upbringing from my mother and father's side and uh, love of science and then the ability to actually conduct science at such an early age, that uh, helped set a path for me. And where did you grow up? <clears throat> I grew up in West Los Angeles. Uh, enjoyed the area you know, near UCLA, near the ocean. It was a, a great place to be. And we moved there in the very late 50s and uh, lived there through, did, did my schooling at UCLA, UC Santa Barbara, UC Irvine. So a good dose of California through my entire education. What, what pulled you away from California in the end? Uh, well, having... Luckily, married my wife, Kristen. Uh, I needed to start paying the bills, and I always did want to work in the pharmacology industry, especially helping discover and uh, develop drugs for the CNS. So I moved to uh, the East Coast to come work at a company called Siba Geigi. Now it's known as Novartis. So that was a, a great opportunity after my postdoc at UC Irvine to really put into play the actual creative process that I'd always dreamed about doing. In fact, it was back in Dr. Uweiler's laboratory where I had a small desk. And right next to my desk, there was a little placard from, I think it was Upjohn Pharmaceuticals. And it said, the best way to create new therapies for brain disorders is to understand the basis of those brain disorders. And that always stayed with me, understanding the cause of disease. And if you know that, you can actually uh, have a real opportunity to come up with a new approach and come up with therapies. And I believe that today more than ever. What got you into the brain? I, I got interested in the brain. Actually, another another figure in my life, a good friend of mine, Doc Renneker, who's now a very famous surfing guy. Mark Renneker and I used to skateboard every uh, weekend at UCLA. That's where we got pretty good at skateboarding in the very earliest days of the sport. Uh, Mark's father was a psychiatrist, and uh, we used to chat about the brain and, you know, his patients to some extent. And I was always fascinated about the whole possibility that you could help people with psychiatric problems by talking with them and by giving them drugs. But it was also around that time in the you know middle to late 60s, as you can imagine, with the psychedelic revolution that came along, uh, we got really interested in this whole idea of how a single molecule could completely change someone's personality, uh, could completely change their insights into the world. To me, that was 
it uh, hasn't gone away as an interest. It's coming full circle now. So that was really interesting to me because I realized that of a single molecule like an LSD or a, a psilocybin can have such profound effects when given as a pill, then our own neurochemistry, when subtly changed, could explain things like depression, like schizophrenia. And so that was kind of an epiphany that I had at a, at a pretty early age uh, and uh, working in the neurobiochemistry lab reinforced that thinking as well. So I think that was part of it. You know, the cultural milieu of Los Angeles at that time and the whole country, really. And uh, but being able to address it from a scientific perspective and then use it. Those were all a great recipe for my career. So you went into biotech. And one thing I've always found interesting about your career, Tony, is you, you know, spending almost, you know, your entire career post postdoc in industry, but you, you've you published like a successful academic. So uh, how have you, you done that? How have you, you managed to keep that up? Yeah, it's an interesting question because the, the general idea is if someone's in academia, they have to publish or perish. And if they're in uh, drug companies, they don't want to tell anybody anything about what they're doing. But I was somehow able to do both. You know, I'm really not sure the answer to that um, because I did most of my, I did a lot of publishing at the University of California. Uh, I think I published three or four papers before I even got my PhD. But, you know, the bulk of my publications was at places like Genentech, at Regeneron, uh, out of Siba Geigy, actually every company I've ever worked at. I don't know, maybe they were a little uh, more permissive for us, but there was also most of those companies, there was also a high priority placed on excellent science, publications, showing the world what was being done. You know, that's a great recruiting tool. I think the companies I worked in always put a, a high premium on that kind of academic excellence as well as developing compounds. So maybe part of it to answer your question was being able to be at places that fostered that kind of environment. And uh, the resources at those companies, you know, to this very day were always very good. And so we had lots of opportunities to to do the work and didn't have to worry about writing grants, we could spend our time writing papers instead. That's another reason I was always attracted to the pharmaceutical industry because you really did have that emphasis on research and, and production rather than scrounging for money and, and, and trying to placate uh, reviewers and play the academic game, which I was pretty turned off about by the time I was done with my postdoc. So how can one as a founder and or manager create an environment that's conducive to that? Uh, very important question. And I'm, I'm faced with that now as I start my own new company with a, a, a co-founder, uh, one company that's focused on gene therapy that we're okay. really very excited about. It's an important question. You want to attract the best and the brightest, which is the mantra at Genentech always. And uh, other companies I've been at, you know, it's really important to hire the best people but you have to retain them too. You know, we, we have to like our boss. That's the number one factor for why people leave. They don't get along with their boss. They need to have a scientific career that's successful and really productive. That's another reason that you retain people because they love the environment they're in and make great results and rewarded with publications. Uh, and you have to see an end product to what you're doing. You know, in a company, we most people who work in companies are there for some of those reasons I mentioned, there's resources, you know, the pay is good, uh, the environment can be outstanding with other colleagues, but we're also there because we wanna make a difference for human health. We wanna really create something like a pill that makes a schizophrenic patient better or a gene therapy product that helps with a neurological decision or a pharmacogenomic product that uh, gets patients on the right medications for their ADHD. I mean, I've been in, allowed to succeed in all of those spheres. And so the best way to retain people has a lot to do with how you recruit them because the people who are coming into a company see the people who are there. And a big part of the decision is the, the boss, but also the colleagues. You know, who am I going to work with in this new environment? And if they're excited and they're doing high quality work and they're hitting all of those criteria I just mentioned, those interviews are going to go great. I remember an interview I had at Regeneron, when I decided to go there and work with Len Schleifer and George Nankopoulos and the team. And the best part of that whole interview process was we went out to dinner one night and there was like 10 people who came to dinner. And we had this fantastic discussion around a big table about 
all the science that was going on and you know things I'd been doing at Genentech at the time. I think after that dinner, I was pretty much decided I'm coming here. So uh, you recruit with the people who are there. You re retain by allowing the new people who've just come in to also succeed. And uh, and you have a high ethical standard. You know, you, you run a company where there's no smoke and mirrors, where there's real results, where the science is first rate, and you can publish in the best journals. And as long as you can manage scientists to achieve that way, you're a good scientific manager. And the rest, I think, will just follow. Uh, my expression for managing scientists is you manage by letting them do good science. And then the other problems which will always arise, you know, comp competition and you know, maybe some jealousies that come along, you know, frictions that develop and uncertainties. I mean, these always will come up in any lab environment. But as long as the results are, you know, these high level achievements, everybody will benefit. And one thing to really pay attention to here is that, and in retrospect, I've become very aware of this, is that it's when you look back at the companies you've been working at, or universities too, it's the team you worked with and the achievements you got as a team that you talk about. I really don't talk much about my own individual accomplishments. I talk about what we did at Otsuka in discovering and developing Abilify. You know, as a huge team, eventually it was 100 people along with another company, Bristol Myers Squibb, uh, and more than 100 uh, eventually to do the clinical work. You know, we as a team developed this best in class, first in class drug for schizophrenia, depression, and bipolar disorder. You know, no one person does that, but it's the team that you're working with that really makes the difference. And so I do believe in that. And, and the best management and the best way to retain people is you encourage that team feeling and you have the team succeed. And uh, I don't know if you're allowed to 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 talk about that, but I mean, can you can you talk about the the development of Abilify and kind of what the thinking was around that and how it went down? Sure. Uh, well, no, I am allowed to talk because it's mostly been published. And in fact, Otsuka is another example of an outstanding company. They're a Japanese pharmaceutical company. It really started back in the 1980s, when I was working along with some other people on trying to come up with a partial dopamine D2 agonist, D2 meaning a dopamine D2 type of receptor. The theory was actually promoted by Dr. Arvid Carlson. You know, Arvid won the Nobel Prize in 2000 because he discovered dopamine, not, not a shabby thing, uh, leading to theories about schizophrenia and Parkinson's disease. And uh, Arvid proposed very early that perhaps instead of blocking a dopamine receptor to treat schizophrenia, which was already known, you could actually put in a partial agonist, which didn't block the receptor, but it quieted the receptor's activity to an intermediate level. Whereas a, a receptor blocker will stop all activity. Okay, that'll treat schizophrenia, but it also creates lots of side effects. So Dr. Carlson proposed that a partial dopamine D2 receptor agonist would lower excessive tone, but bring lower tone up to a sort of a middle level. And so I worked on that in the early 1980s. And at Siba Geigy, we, we even brought some drugs to the clinic. Unfortunately, those drugs had some liver metabolism problems, and the company was really quite conservative and didn't pursue it any further than that. So when I got the opportunity to interview at Otsuka to head up their global neuroscience department, I looked at this early clinical data and some of the ideas about the mechanism, and I realized this was very similar to work I'd already done. But now we were 15 years later. And so I was able to take that job and uh, manage the team in Japan and in the U.S. And uh, we further profiled the compound. One of the important things about Abilify is it's not, turns out, it's not only a partial dopamine receptor agonist. We discovered that it's a partial serotonin agonist as well. So we realized it could maybe not only treat schizophrenia, but depression and bipolar disorder because of what Arvid Carlson, who now was one of our consultants, called a serotonin dopamine system stabilizer. And I thought that was a brilliant concept. And that's, that went on to be a marketing uh, tool to describe how Abilify works. Well, there are 10 times more people with depression than schizophrenia and three, two to three times more people 
with bipolar than schizophrenia. So the result was Abilify was the largest grossing drug worldwide in 2014. And I think to this day has treated millions and millions of patients. So I've been blessed that I was able to work with Dr. Carlson on this project and with this fantastic team, both at Otsuka and Bristol Myers Squibb to get this really important drug made. And all this is publicly known. And uh, there have been many imitators since. Yeah, that's a huge accomplishment. Well, thank you. It was, uh, well, there's an important term here for that accomplishment, and it, it's persistence. You know, it, persistence is probably the most important single attribute that we as scientists have to embody because we're not going to succeed the first time. Uh, and, and if we persist, however, we'll eventually succeed. And sometimes we have to come full circle. So I had to go from my work at Siba Geigy to coming back to a new company to finally get that project finished. You know, that's, that's a really important thing is, is to persist. So what, what most excites you in the field of neuropsychiatry? What do you think will have the biggest impact for patients in the, the next 20 years? Uh, I think for psychiatry, it's maybe a little harder to say than let's say for neurology, where I was hoping you were going with the question, <laughs> but in psychiatry, the reason I'm a little more hesitant is because a lot of our psychiatric knowledge has come from how drugs work and which drugs work. And then we, by luck, we happen to come across a, an antidepressant and then we elaborate on those kinds of drugs without really understanding why people are depressed in the first place. And so the targets in psychiatry are not as clear. Uh, there have been some significant breakthroughs with a class of drugs called muscarinic agonists, which for schizophrenia have been proven now to be very effective. And that may only be the second receptor target that has ever been validated for treating schizophrenia. Luckily, in the early around 2005, my team at a company called Psychiatric Genomics discovered that very approach. And it's been now finally capitalized by a company called Karuna. They made a drug that is actually a muscarinic agonist that's coupled with another drug. And, though, and that has proven to be very effective in schizophrenia. So that may be the only the second target after dopamine receptors to treat schizophrenia. So I've luckily been involved in both the partial dopamine agonist innovation and now maybe this muscarinic agonist. If uh, indeed further trials continue to show that it's so effective. I think those are that muscarinic approach is perhaps one of the most important breakthroughs in psychiatry today, because I don't think it's only going to be useful in schizophrenia. I think it may also be useful for Alzheimer's disease, because a very similar story about muscarinic receptor subactivation has been made for Alzheimer's disease as well. So it could well be that this very same drug, which was made originally at Eli Lilly. Uh, could be useful in treating Alzheimer's disease. And that's, of course, that would be a huge breakthrough. What if you were to answer the same question for neurology? Would it would it be the same answer with uh, the muscarinic receptor? Well, maybe for Alzheimer's, it, it actually could. I mean, Alzheimer's patients do have a deficiency of muscarinic receptor signaling and metabolism of brain neurons as a result. So that could be, but I don't think that's going to be the final answer because I think that kind of approach treats some of the symptoms of the disease, but not the cause. And therein lies the real difference between neurology and psychiatry. So for neurology, I think a lot of these causes are at the, at the genetic level. And we know that's true for many disorders. We know that for Alzheimer's. We know it for uh, ALS. We know it for Parkinson's disease. We know it for Huntington's disease. And the list goes on and on. For all of these diseases, there's always a subgroup or often a subgroup of patients for whom the genetic mutation that they inherited is the cause of the disorder. And you don't see that in psychiatry. There's very few of any genes that have been linked uh, to psychiatric conditions, let alone with the penetrance that you see for the neurological mutations. So we have a huge opportunity now in neurology to know that at least for a subset of patients, sometimes it's all of them, like in Huntington's disease, where there's a genetic mutation that is the cause. So we know the target, which is quite a difference to what you have in psychiatry, where we are, hardly have a clue about what the target is. 
So that's where I see it as a huge advantage. And because it's a genetic problem, the nucleus and the gene expression of nuclear DNA is often the cause of why those patients go on to develop these neurological conditions. So I think for neurological conditions, gene therapy is a much more viable option. And we've already seen that proven in just the last few years with the approval of Finraza for spinal muscular atrophy uh, and uh, Luxterna for a form of blindness, both of which are due to inherited mutations in genes important for those systems that are diseased. Cool. So shifting gears a bit, can you tell us about your, uh, about your skateboarding? <laughs> skateboarding. Sure. When did you get into it? <clears throat> well, I was very lucky. I got into it very early on. You know, I mentioned how I got all my training in Los Angeles. I went through the uh, Los Angeles Unified School District system at places like Paul Revere Junior High School and Pacific Palisades High. You know, I was involved from the very earliest days. Some of my buddies, like John Fries, you know, he was the first national skateboard champion. And the year after John, I was able to compete in the same tournament, and I did pretty well. Part of that is because we lived in West L.A., where I think, as far as we can tell, that the sport originated. If it didn't certainly originate there, we kind of did a lot of the improvements. So for me, skateboarding is, today, it's a way for me to keep my brain in shape. Uh, I don't do it just for the fun of it. It's a great aerobic sport. Uh, you know, it requires a lot of balance, coordination, persistence. You know, it's tiring. If you do it right, it's uh, it's a full workout. So I partly do it for that. You know, there's a lot of similarities with science. And in order to what we did in the early days, we innovated. We had to make our own skateboards. We would cut roller skates in half, and then put put them on either end of the board. Uh, we needed to figure out new materials to make the boards from. At the same time, it was fun. Got chased away by uh, dogs and angry adults. Uh, you know, was eventually able to compete at the highest level. And there's a lot of similarities with scientific achievement. You know, it was only later that my buddies and I, kind of looking back, realized that we were on the forefront of a brand new sport, totally in awe with what people are doing nowadays on a skateboard. But we were part of that early, very early phase. And I think that was exciting at the time. And I see science in a similar way. You know, I, I, I kind of still like to do science because it helps keep my brain in shape too. I have to think a lot, uh, have to innovate, have to plan new stuff, work in an area that no one else has been working on and carve out new territory. So it's, uh, there's kind of a similar process going on there. Tell us about the polyurethane wheels. Oh, <laughs> um, because my best friend at the time, Mark Renneker, and I did a lot of skateboarding. And because Hobie, which is a manufacturer of skateboards, sponsored a lot of skateboard tournaments in Santa Monica, I was able to get into the tournament scene. Luckily, in 1966, I was on a skateboard team. And at that time, we were skateboarding on kind of a rubbery cork wheel. It was okay, but if you had a little pebble, the skateboard would just stop dead and you'd go flying. So it uh, made you very uh, cautious. So one day, our skateboard team, we were sitting around a table, and our captain of the team, he came in with his paper bag, and he poured out this bunch of wheels on the table. And they were all these white polyurethane wheels, which we had never seen before. In fact, most of us have been skateboarding on metal wheels just a few years before. And we looked at these wheels and we realized immediately what this might mean. And we put them on our boards and sure enough, the boards were much easier to navigate. You could go over little rocks and not get stopped. You had a lot more contact with the surface. And uh, luckily, I think I was able to continue to compete like in various tournaments, including the national tournament on those new wheels. And that really helped. So it was a nice example of where an innovative tool really helped you jump ahead. Funny thing about these polyurethane wheels, it turns out they were the absolute first polyurethane wheels ever made for a skateboard. I mean, that bag came from one batch that had just been made. No other skateboard wheels had ever been made. And when I talked to the experts who, who you know, really follow skateboard lore, if I asked them when they thought the first polyurethane wheels came out, they said, oh, mid-1970s. We were almost 10 years earlier 
with these wheels. So <laughs> that was, uh, I still have them, of course. Nice collector piece. Find all the people who have written um, the history of skateboarding and set them straight. You know, there's this one guy, we had a big rally at the Smithsonian Museum about five years ago. And, you know, Tony Hawk showed up and Rodney Mullen and all the great guys came. And, you know, we already knew some of them. One, one gentleman who was the professor, they call him, because he professes to have all this knowledge about skateboarding. And he's a good skateboarder himself, but he was wearing a white lab coat. That, you know, he was a skateboard expert. And he was the guy that thought that the first polyurethane wheels were out in like mid 1970s. But uh, yeah, actually, the Smithsonian wanted the board that I have with those wheels on it, but I wouldn't give it to them. Nice. <laughs> So how did you come to live a stone's throw from NIH? Oh, when Otsuka hired me to, to uh, head up global neuroscience, the, the uh, Otsuka lab was here in Rockville, Maryland. So we moved out at that time. What, what changes have you seen uh, in the biotech scene on the 270 corridor? You know, I think the uh, biotech scene on, along the 270 corridor is really starting to come on to its own. Uh, it's always been a great promise, and there's always been biotech companies. As I mentioned, I headed up one of them called Psychiatric Genomics in Gaithersburg. It never really became a you know, mecca like Austin, and it still isn't quite to that level. But in the last five years, I think things have really been picking up. I know uh, having found new laboratory space ourselves in just the last few months, you know, lab space is still at a premium, and very large laboratory facilities are now being created and moved into very quickly. Companies like Novavax, Regenex Bio, Metamune, uh, you know, and AstraZeneca that took over the Metamune site. You know, there's a lot of activity that's building now some, from some very successful companies. So uh, I think it's starting to really pick up and having NIH here, having the FDA here, uh, having a lot of other pharma and other organizations that are associated with our industry certainly doesn't hurt. And so there's a lot of really talented people in this area. I'm just surprised it's taken as long as it has. It's a great area to live in and uh, housing is affordable here. A lot of talent, a lot of universities. So, uh, you know, I, I think it's just going to continue to build now. If you were a young biomedical scientist just leaving academia, what, what geographic area would you head towards, right? Obviously, there are many biotech ecosystems around around the world, really. W which do you think might have the most promise if you're looking out over the next uh, generation or two? Yeah, geography is important, but I define geography more by the laboratory geography. Uh, I'd rather be in a great lab that's in a good institution uh, almost anywhere in the country uh, compared to being in, let's say, a San Francisco area in, in not so good a lab or not, a, in, let's say, a more competitive and tight situation. I think the local environment is more important. If the lab is fostering excellent research and people are productive, much like I described for companies themselves, I think that's the most important thing for a person to choose. Uh, the other thing though, besides geography, is the opportunity that you find in that first job after a postdoc. So are there innovative techniques and new methods that are coming out of that group that you're working with? Are they uh, giving you projects that allow you to see your field of science in a way that no one else has been able to look at before? I'm a big proponent on new methods. I think new methods are almost always the key. I mean, look at the uh, CRISPR you know, Nobel Prize that was just awarded. It's, it's a new method that was realized first for bio, basic biology, but then uh, exploited for its potential therapeutic use. And that creates a field day for you. If you come into a lab with new techniques, new ways of seeing science, new ways of exploiting science, uh, everything you do is going to be innovative and uh, important. I would encourage people to think about doing stuff that's on the cutting edge, as opposed to coming into a lab to kind of put the uh, dot the I's and cross the T's on the principal investigator's work. You don't really want to be there because that's going to be stuff where many other people have already been. And when you go into the marketplace, let's say your next job, you want to be able to be in a position to say, I've carved out this whole new area. I see that you're expanding in that area. I'd love to work with your team. 
And I've seen that in the gene therapy field. For example, about five years ago, there was a big breakthrough in gene therapy delivery, ways of getting gene therapy products into the brain or into specific tissues. And that was a huge area. It's continuing to build. It's continuing to show promise. And I noticed that all the young investigators that were working in that field were getting jobs and moving to new places and new companies. I know where the, all these guys are getting uh, great offers to move. And that's because the field was seeing the growth of this area. So it wanted people with those skills to help those other concerns move to where they needed to be. So that's why the innovative stuff where you can see a real application uh, in the commercial world, I think is the best single geography to consider, not so much where that lab happens to be. What do you think will be the big changes coming to biotech as an industry in the coming years? I think um, one of the big changes is in the field of bioinformatics. I've actually been a bit skeptical about big data and bioinformatics for a while. And partly I think that's because bioinformaticians sometimes don't have a good handle on the biology that they're trying to uncover through their methods. At the same time, I give biologists a little bit of uh, uh, grief too, because I think we as biologists uh, need to do a better job knowing about statistics and bioinformatic databases and what they can and can't provide. Well, uh, and, and getting quality data has been a, a real limitation. Uh, just RNA-seq data, for example, can take a whole variety of forms. There are many different ways to measure RNAs, and how you measure it has a huge impact on the interpretations you make. But I see a lot of people just blindly measuring the RNA, and they don't really know what they're actually measuring. Is it nuclear? Is it cytoplasmic? Is it both? Is it a cell type specific? I mean, the questions go on and on, and these are important questions. But to answer your question about where I think things are going uh, in biotechnology, I think bioinformatics will come to play a bigger and bigger role as quality data is provided, as tools are created to analyze that, as people understand better on both sides of the equation, what we're looking at and how we're interpreting it. And I think there'll be quite a revolution in how we can target uh, disease therapies through what we learn from the bioinformatic analysis. It's good news for us. <laughs> well, I'm well, partly working with you, Grant. Uh, you've helped us actually understand some important properties uh, along the way. You know, I think it's just going to get better as these methods continue to unva- unravel what's going on in, in gene expression and gene processing for these diseases that are clearly genetic in nature. So I think that's the second level of of great excitement in the biotechnology field is using these targets and these mechanisms that we're learning about to come up with therapies. I mean, we were a bit lucky. Well, maybe I shouldn't say lucky. We we worked very hard to find this muscarinic receptor target for schizophrenia. It was basically a four-year odyssey, but it worked. And the reason I say we were lucky is the cells that we used in our in vitro assay happened to have muscarinic receptors. And we knew that was always going to be a limitation. Do the cells even have the receptor mechanisms that you're going to be evaluating? Often people don't even ask that question. Well, we did a whole profiling, so we knew what those cell lines expressed. So we knew what candidates could come up because they were there. And the other receptor candidates we'd never learn about because they weren't expressed. But those are the kind of questions that we have to ask. So I think a good thing for bioinformatics experts to keep in mind is to learn the biology about what you're being asked to analyze, you know, to be aware of the experimental design and really know about the material that you're analyzing, whether it's RNA-seq data or cell-based data, you know, what are the constraints? What might you never learn about because the cells don't express those, those players? Or you're looking at the wrong cell type, so you can never learn about the mechanism of disease because the disease is due to another cell. You have to learn about the biology, and it's not just one-sided. You know, the biologists also have to learn about what they're asking the bioinformatics person to analyze and what the limitations or possibilities are from that data. So you've worked remotely a pretty good chunk of your recent career, at least. Uh, can you comment on what you've learned from that? And, and do you have any any advice in this time of COVID where everyone's working remotely, most everyone's managing remotely? How, how do you pull it off? 
Well, I'm, I'm actually about not to pull it off. I'm about to be back in the lab. Uh, I'm really looking forward to that, learning molecular biology skills and applying what I've been learning over the last few years of genetics. I'm not a big fan of remote work. Uh, certainly, it can be done. I'm a bigger fan of remote meetings. I don't think people need to get on a plane and travel across the country for a one-hour meeting. Uh, I've even heard of a person, once he flew all the way from here to Asia for dinner, when dinner was over, he was put on a plane and he came back. I mean, this is uh, crazy, and uh, it's not very helpful to our environment as well. I think we have a real responsibility to preserve and improve our environment. And I think remote meetings are fantastic. I, I'm seeing that as a real advantage. But the workplace is different. I think people really should be, when possible, in a similar physical proximity to one another, especially in a laboratory environment where you have to be there to do the, the actual work. So, you know, hopefully when our COVID-19 vaccines come along and people start wearing masks and uh, behaving properly so we can abruptly put an end to this pandemic, uh, people will look at the best of all these worlds. We'll have remote meetings. We'll be back in the workplace. You know, our commutes won't be maybe five days a week. Maybe they'll be three and four. And we mix it up a bit and, you know, just work to our own better advantage for all of these things. Do you care to prognosticate about what will happen with COVID? When when will things start to get back to normal? Um, I can't. I'm not an expert, but one thing is really clear: if if we all behave ourselves in a consorted way and show discipline about wearing masks, about keeping our social distance, about not having these large gatherings, and the vaccine becomes available, which it looks like it will. We do all of those things. As of January 20th, I would give it then another four months uh, before we see a, a real improvement. And by the end of the year, we'll be back almost to normal. But that's the most you know, optimistic scenario. The harsh reality is there are a lot of people who still will refuse to wear masks and won't want to get vaccinated. And that won't stop the process, but it will slow it down quite a bit. And what surprised you the most about this pandemic and the response to it? I guess what surprised me the most about this pandemic is how so many people will refuse to wear masks. You know, we ask our soldiers who go to war to wear 50 pounds of gear and, and to go into battle wearing that kind of gear every day and literally risking their life to fight an enemy. Well, here we have COVID-19 as an enemy and I'm shocked when I see people who aren't willing to wear a one ounce mask and actually defeat an enemy that's killed more people than these wars. So I really don't know what's up about that, except that maybe it, is, it has become a political statement for people who just don't like to be told what to do. But we live in a society where we have to drive the speed limit. We have to follow certain laws. And this to me seems like a, a great example of just another minor adjustment that people should be making. And, and most do in many areas, the compliance is 90% and above, but it isn't everywhere. So if we all pull together and make these small adjustments, our economy can recover much more quickly in the long run. That surprises me that I even have to say things like this, or I'm parroting what other people say. That's the big surprise. It would seem like this should just happen as a matter of uh, common sense. It's a bit depressing. <laughs> You, yeah, it is. But I think we'll get through this. And uh, the vaccines, I think, will make a, a huge difference. As a final question, maybe a bit of a humdinger, um, <laughs> what do you think most scientists today have wrong? Well, let me rephrase the question a little bit. What do I think scientists nowadays, especially the younger group of scientists are coming into industry, really need to pay particular attention to. We all need to pay attention to the limitations of the data that we simply download from the internet. You know, I remember the first scientist who said, well, I'm gonna Google that term and look up the answer. And I thought, what, are you, are you crazy? Aren't you gonna go, go to the library stacks and pull out the journal articles and read the articles and figure it all out? Well, both methods are clearly limited. But you know, nowadays people do go to Google and they type in pretty much anything they wanna learn about science. And you certainly can learn a lot, there's no question. It's a fantastic tool. 
But the problem and what people get wrong is that's kind of where it stops. So they go, well, I read, I saw on the web that you can use this assay and that's what we're going to do. What they don't do then, they don't say, well, gee, is that assay really the right one for me? Or can I compare it with two others that I learned about? What do I have to do empirically in the lab to answer for myself that what I'm reading and learning from the internet is true? And what I see as a real problem, and I hear this from other people who have trained students and see the new crops coming and going, is there doesn't seem to be as much willingness to run the empirical foundational studies that are needed to convince you that you're on the right path. And so scientists often can kind of move into the wrong direction and they're doomed to fail from the get-go. You have to, I think, do the experiments in the lab to convince yourself that you're on the right path. Is your analytical tool sensitive enough? Does it give you the kind of information that you need? Is it analyzing the right materials to even answer the question? You know, all of these kinds of things. And so, you know, I'm a big believer in positive controls and negative controls. You want to run your assay with outcomes you fully expect. I mean, we did an RNA-seq study recently with a database that was provided by Grant's company. The first experiment I did when Grant provided the data to me was I said, okay, if this data is correctly provided from Grant's team, I should be able to recreate the figure from which this data was deposited. And sure enough, we exactly recreated the data that was in the publication for one gene. And that gave me confidence that the other genes are going to give me probably accurate results. So that's the kind of stuff you need to do. You need to convince yourself in the lab empirically that you're on the right track and not just assume that because you found a method somewhere that that's going to work. And we all know most methods that you've just snagged from somewhere don't work. You've got to tweak them. And then sadly enough, many of the results that we get in papers can't be replicated. So the way to get it right is to have the right methods and show that you can produce reproducible results that convince yourself that the methods are right. So I I mentioned persistence, how persistence is important. Replication is my other favorite word in science. We have to be able to replicate what we've done and what other people have done with similar methods before we have any confidence that we're on the right track. Couldn't agree more. Well, thank you so much for joining us today, Tony. It was great. It was a great pleasure to be with you, Grant. And uh, I look forward to uh, seeing great things out of your own organization and from all of us who really are committed to putting all of this that we've been talking about together so that we can help people get over inherited diseases, acquired diseases, and even those that are spontaneous. There's a lot to be learned. Well, there's really no end to what uh, medical science is going to be able to achieve. And it's just exciting to be part of this. What will science do next?